So welcome back to another edition of the Impact Sessions with Nick Bramley. This week, we've got an absolute first. I've got two guests in their studio. When I say studio, it's their office and their bubble. But I've got Terry Mullen and Mark Llewellyn, who are Joint Managing Directors of Revive Auto Innovations. Revive are a fabulous business, heavily involved in the franchise sector, and, and they're an award-winning business in that sector. But some of the lessons they're going to share with us today are eminently transferable into any business. And we've titled this particular impact sessions, How Managing Your Goals Created Award-Winning Success. So without further ado, welcome to the impact sessions, Terry and uh, Mark, how are you doing? Thank you, Nick, doing very well. Good, thank you. You've had an interesting year, we'll explore bits of that as we go through. Um, but it's always worthwhile explaining to people, give us a bit of background on you know, Revive Auto Innovations, what it's about, what it does, the dynamics between you two as joint MDs. How did that all come about? Just give us a, a short potted history so we know, you know, who we're engaging with. So uh, Revive was created in 2004 and um, is a mobile paint repair service fixing minor damage on vehicles. So we fix uh, bump scuffs and uh, uh, alloy wheels from a fleet of um, uh, mobile vans. Um, we currently have uh, just under 200 um, technicians across the country. Um, Terry and I work very closely together. Uh, we specialize in the roles that uh, most suit us. So I look after the, the sales and marketing and Terry deals with the finance and operations for the, the company. Okay. It's a very successful business in the fact that um... Lots of people do incur bits of damage to their vehicles that they want sort of sorting out. And I think the phrase that you've used is if it's not the body shop, then it doesn't need sort of full replacement of wings and, 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 and that kind of thing. Smart repairs is the phrase, isn't it? Scuffs, bumps, alloys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you're very successful at that. We're going to explore that in a little, a little bit more detail. But I've called this about sort of managing the, the, your goals and, and award winning success. Within the franchise sector, and congratulations on your uh, silver award that you, you got on Monday, we'll explore awards later, you are rightly held up as a, as a really successful uh, uh, operation and business within the franchise sector. So you've grown from 2004 starting point to, you know, multi-site delivery through, you know, 200 technicians, etc. cetera. Um, do you want to share with us a little bit about what the ambition was in 2004 and, and where you are towards that? Because it strikes me that you've been on a hell of a journey, but it's nearly always been upwards, which is great to see. So just tell us a bit about goal setting and you know what the ambition was in 2004 and where you are now. Okay, Nick, so back in 2004, uh, we set an initial high level goal to do network sales of 10 million pounds. And that goal's changed over the years. We've got more and more ambitious, if you like. Uh, but how that came about was interesting. I, I, my background's in banking, so I had up until then, any business goals I had set were always done on a spreadsheet and there were a rolling trend. It was based on you know, what your business did and how you could uh, use that trend to project forward. But Mark and I, one of the good things I think we've done over the years is we've always been open to um, external advice. So we had a number of business consultants over the years um, to advise us in different areas of the business as we, as our needs have changed, if you like. And really, really early on uh, in our first year when our turnover was, I don't know, it was projected to be about £600,000 network sales. We sat down with a business consultant on a, a business programme, I think it was called Asia, and they said to, to us, what do you want to do? How do you want to exit the business? One day when you sell the business, how much do you want to get for the business? What if you want to get that much money? How, what turnover do you need to do? And bear in mind, we were, we were uh, doing about £600,000 a year. And Mark said £10 million. Was that, just a, was that just a number at that stage, Mark? A round number that came to your head? Um, uh, the, 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 the truth is, uh, I think at the time we earned 60% of the... Uh, um, uh, shares in the business and 
six million pounds, you can live like a millionaire. So I thought, oh, let's live like a millionaire. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think I can remember being, whoa, <laughs> you know, to be at the time when you were, when you're starting off a business to have, to be looking forward to selling and what your goal needs to be then was a bit counterintuitive to me, but it's worked really well. So, um, the industry, the value of repairs in the industry is massive, you know, um, difficult to, to put a number on, maybe 300 million pounds we worked out the opportunity in the industry was. So 10 million wasn't actually that audacious. So we worked on a 10 million goal, goal initially. Um, and then about seven or eight years ago, we changed that to a goal of 20 million by 2020. Can I just stop you there, Terry? I love, I love the fact that it just goes up in massive round numbers, doesn't it? <laughs> well, if we're at 10, what's the next? Oh, let's go 20. I'll just love that kind of the, the level of let's just do it, you know? And, and that I think is 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 part of the exploration. So so you change it to 20. Where were you when you changed it to 20? Were you already at 10 or approaching 10? We're on five. Oh, good grief. That's really, really impressive. <laughs> right. So you went. Right. We've changed it again since then. Okay. So you're a goal-setting organisation. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't sound like there was much strategy behind the numbering of that. We'll go with 10, we'll go with 20. That's brilliant, by the way. Is that a blessing and a curse, that, in terms of, you know, is it a big sort of millstone around your neck or is it just such a uh, an aspiration that everything focuses on it? How do you deal with a goal on that level then? I, I um, personally believe in setting really um, high objectives. And, and in fact, one of the, the things that I've learned over the years is to try and bring those things a little bit closer rather than just being pie in the sky all the time. So, um, and I do this on a personal level and on a, on a um, business level as well. And um, I believe that if you um, want to achieve these things and set those um, objectives and then work back how you're going to achieve them, um, you have a, a, an opportunity to achieve those objectives. If you don't set them in the first place, then it's a bit like, you know, um, I've never had a business, um, never wanted to have a business that just floats along and you just go turn up and, and, and buy a job. That, that's not what I'm about. It's about creating something, creating something substantial, looking at what the opportunity is. And I think that each step of the way, we get more confidence that we can achieve these things. Um, it does put pressure on ourselves uh, to, to, to work, but I think that um, one of the, uh, the things that we have in common is neither of us are shy of uh, hard work and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think that as we reach objectives, and see the, the objectives that we're um, achieving. And also that cascades down to our franchise network. They start to see what, what they're, they're achieving. Um, we, we push ourselves even further. So um, for me, it's just a strong motivation. I don't feel any um, pressure from these things other than to deliver. And it's something that I feel personally as well. Um, I set myself some objectives I, I took, um, but one of the clearest ones I took up running um, at a, a, a later date, and I always thought about um, running under a uh, half marathon under two hours. Mm. And when I set that objective, I was doing it in two hours twenty. And uh, but you know, I I did it, and the first time I um, achieved a sub two hour um, half marathon was at the Great North Run, and I did one hour fifty nine and fifty two seconds. And those, those eight seconds are important, though, aren't they? Mark? They were hugely uh, important. But you know, the, the next run that I did, the next time I did a half marathon, I did it in one fifty one because yeah. it, it was a uh, um, a goal that had been broken and an objective achieved, and then uh, it was much easier to, to believe. So I think your mind is a, an incredible thing, and if you give your mind the, the right. Um, uh, directives and, and point it in the right direction. There's a lot of really exciting things that can happen. But one of the things I saw you at uh, uh, the British Franchise Association conference earlier in the week, and one of the things that inspired me was I think in the early days, the goal was sort of yours and Terry's, wasn't it? It was like, you know, we've set this goal, but at five million or at some stage in the journey, you decided that actually we need to invest that communication in the team. Um, 
that can be quite scary for a team member who's not as goal oriented as you. What was what was the decision behind that? What made you sort of look to in, in, sort of excite and ignite the team? And what reactions did you get from your team when you started to, started talking about ten and twenty million pounds for the business? What was the response you got from it? It was a mixed response, to be honest, Nick. I think initially, uh, because we we had to communicate it to our franchise owners. And the reason we wanted to do that is we, we realized that unless our franchise owners were as ambitious in their business as we were in ours, we were not, we were unlikely to achieve our goal. So we had to share the, um, the goal with the, the franchise owners. And then we had to also share that goal with our internal team. And it was mixed. There was some, some of it cynical. I can remember at, at a conference, um, sitting with one of our franchisees and him saying to me, do you really think you can do it though, Terry? Come on, you know, you stand up there, do you really think you can do 10 million pounds? And, you know, we said, yeah, you know, of course we can, you know, uh, yeah, we believe we can do 10 million, 20 million, 40 million, we, we, we really, really do. So I think um, the important thing is you've got to really explain what's in it for the people that you're communicating it with, because what we didn't want uh, our staff or our franchisees to feel that w- that it was just about me and Mark becoming richer <laughs> and, and working towards that exit of our, our business being valuable. So you have to translate it into how it's how it, it can make them more successful. So our franchise owners, um, it was how their businesses could be bigger, more exciting, more profitable, uh, you know, um, better than buying a job as a man in a van. And for our internal team, our head office, it was uh, explaining what our head office would look like, how many people we would eventually need as we grew, what opportunities for development and advancement they would have. And you've got to, you know, get them all along for the ride sort of thing. So it didn't happen overnight. Um, You know, I think we had to, for several years, um, we had to keep reinforcing the message at every opportunity, our annual conference, at regional meetings, at staff meetings, at our, you know, staff Christmas party, you know, we, we, we stand up and let people know how we're doing against our goal um, and, uh, you know, if we're on course to achieve it. So it took a bit of doing, but um, I think they eventually became really, really excited about it. Well, I think it's fair to say that cultural change takes time and you're changing people's habits and behaviours and you know, somebody might have bought a franchise in the early days alongside you, you know, to do paint repairs on, on vehicles and, you know, be happy with a certain income and a certain level of, you know, sort of lifestyle. Um, but then you looked at it and said, if we're going to achieve that, we need to think about our business model. And this is transferable, whether it's a franchise business model or a, a, an employed business model or whatever. You had to change your business model to meet your objectives. And there's two things that struck me. One is you changed the the focus of what a franchisee should look like for you. And then the second one was you put a massively sort of high profile, what do you call it, accelerated growth plan um, program together. Do you want to talk me through the two? Maybe the first one is in terms of realizing that, you know, you can't get on a journey with everybody doing a certain thing. You've got to inspire them to be different or bigger. What was the, what was the thought process around changing the sort of, the franchise recruitment piece, really? Well, I, I think um, there's there's a few things here. Um, as Terry's already said, uh, to achieve these higher level targets, it couldn't be just about Terry and I. And the first thing I'd say was that employees buy into success. So while we communicated strongly with them, people want to be associated with success and growth it um, drives success. So that's uh, an exciting part of what goes on. Um, communicating with franchisees and, and um, the changes that we needed to make was, was more significant and, and took a, a, a longer time because, as you rightly said, the, um, working with a franchisee who is a separate business, their objectives and their own personal goals may not be aligned with what we're doing. And so that's a challenge. So what we understood was that there would be different levels of franchisees and different um, uh, desires to achieve things of, uh, for, for franchisees. 
And if we had a franchisee who was um, achieving and delivering the service level that we needed in a smaller area, that was okay. But they needed to make sure that they were delivering those service levels and exploiting the territory that um, that, that we, we needed them to, to do. So just, just cutting across that then, so irrespective of ambition, it was still all about delivering on the revive DNA then, wasn't it? Even if it was at, at, on a localised, small localised level. Yeah, we, we can't, we can't, even if we're growing <laughs> faster, even if we're growing faster, we cannot compromise on our values. That's the thing that's made us successful from the start. And so that has got to go all through what we're, what we're doing. Um, so changing the message to, to the franchisees and talking about um, uh, the AGP programme, these were tools that we needed because the model that we had was taking a, a franchisee, training them to paint and um, uh, getting them to be manage a successful business with them painting cars and leading their team. For us to um, take a step change in the growth that we, we wanted and, and to, to, to take the sales up a notch, we, we needed to get those guys out of the van um, so that they could work, you know, in the, in the cliche, um, they work on their business, not in their business. But they, be, they become business professionals rather than technicians then, don't they? Yes. yes. And um, that was challenging because even really strong uh, franchisees um, we were taking them out of their comfort zone. Mm. We were um, uh, getting them to think about finances and think about planning and, and stuff where their day-to-day -day was all around um, technical competencies. And we developed a really strong suite of technical um, uh, proficiencies. We, we had a very, very good reputation, still have a very good reputation for the technical work that we do. You've got we an can... Have you got an academy for that? Have you got a paint yeah. academy and, and whatever? I think that's, I, I loved that when I came to see you. I, I loved the fact that it's got function. A, a paint academy sounds better than, I'm going to show you how to paint a few vehicles or do some alloy repairs. Paint academy has got some gravitas, hasn't it? And, and I love, that's really about what you're about, isn't it? Things like that. One of our qualities is technical excellence. And I always believed um, coming through the business and being in the band myself, that we could do an outstanding job. But there wasn't any um, differentiation at, at, at one point between a professional repairer, uh, a smart, smart repairer, and a non-professional smart repairer. Two people could turn up with, with um, different looking bands and you wouldn't know who was the professional repairer until after the job. So um, I got involved with the IMI, the Institute for the Motor Industry. They saw that the set was growing and saw that there was no um, regulation, no um, uh, quality standard, if you like. And I was the only smart repairer um, representing Revive um, that was on that panel with insurers and, and car manufacturers to put um, the IMI um, accreditation together. And so we are an IMI uh, accredited um, training academy, um, and that 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 was all part of the technical expertise that we we required. Okay, so just, what, just, sorry to, I'm just conscious of I've got a lot I want to get through on that, and I want to I want to address the question of the softer skills. I, I really hate that phrase, by the way, but it's the one that people refer to: the management skills, the business skills, the things that. Because as a technician, if you've bought a franchise and, you, and you're good with your hands and you're technically, you know, whatever, then you've, you've formalised that into an academy. I totally get that. But you're also talking about making some of these people much more rounded in a business sense. And I love what you're doing with the accelerated growth plan and that side of it. So maybe Terry, sorry to cut across you there, Matt. I just want to explore that a little bit as well in terms of, the, you know, what have you done around the... The, the other side of it, the non-technical side, to give people a chance to grow their business and get away from the, the, the van uh, mentality? Mm -hmm. Well, the Accelerated Growth um, Planning Programme is a year-long training uh, programme that covers a, num a number of modules uh, that uh, include the softer skills. So we knew in terms of people, if we were going to um, grow our sales, there would need to be more people in the organisation predominantly more paint technicians and painters, and they were going to be employed by ourselves and by our franchisees, and at head office, we were going to need more people. So the, um, I mentioned earlier that Mark and I have never been shy of using external consultants to 
help us um, move our business on. And we both met um, a, a leadership coach, a lady who um, uh, at Warwick University, she um, lectures on leadership all over the world. So we brought her in to talk to our franchise owners about uh, what, you know, how staff, how people engage with the, uh, the, the businesses that they work for and how it's not just about the monetary reward and the money that you pay them. There, there are so many other things that as business owners and employers you can do mm. to retain uh, pe good people in your organisation. So um, we help train um, our franchisees on leadership skills. We've um, devolved that and passed that down to some of our leadership team internally at head office. We've got, uh, we've been working through a leadership programme and we um, went through the investors and people framework as well. So we've invested quite heavily in understanding better and helping our franchise owners who in turn uh, turn our employers understand better how to, to um, retain and attract staff. My, my house phone just went, so unfortunately, I, I, I normally leave it out of the room when we're filming, and uh, anyway, so there's been, been a house phone ringing on my uh, on my phone, so apologies for that. So um, so it's really about looking and saying, we've got this ambition, we've got this goal, we've got this entire team, a head office function, we've got business owners who've bought a franchise, communication's key, development's key, and making sure that we upskill them to give them the confidence to deliver. So where did the journey go on that big goal from five to 10 to 20? You know, was it accelerated by the accelerated growth plan? Was it, you know, what was the, what was the outcome on that journey as a result of what you've invested in, which is clearly a lot of time, effort and energy in the team? Well, I, I guess the, um, the, the, the key changes have been had the base of a strong technical training center. Understanding, Terry and I understood that we needed the business training to be at the same uh, level and stuff. And training the franchisees in a different way, once they got it, they realized and they were coming to us and saying, you know, these big um, uh, goals that you want, we want to be part of that. and We can deliver a million pounds of that. And then, then what happens is the, the, the franchisees get competitive amongst themselves and the peer pressure helps drive all of the businesses up. And, you know, we've seen this year, even in a, in a, a year where we've had a couple of months out because of the, the pandemic and stuff, that um, some of the sales that the franchisees have been able to achieve have been quite extraordinary. You know, we've had two record months in the last three months and coming into um, the last quarter of the year, that's really remarkable given the, the, the situation that, that we've done. But it's because there's a different mindset with the franchisees. We now have, you know, um, uh, two thirds of our network competing at the higher level of uh, sales now, where if we went back five years, um, we, we would have a handful of guys at, at that level. But the, the number of franchisees now um, at a much higher level of sales. And, and it's all been driven by, it's a bit, it's, it's a, an iterative process where bits come together, but having put the training together, got franchisees excited, the peer pressure that's then engendered has been really, really exciting. I love, so, I love a competitive element to it because it's, it's human instinct for a lot of people, isn't it? To, to A, want to be better than you were last month or last year, but also then, have you got a table? Where am I in the table? People just naturally look and go, oh, I could catch them with a bit of focus on this and I could become number one or number two, whatever it might be. So brilliant culture, brilliant culture. I really like that. And it's not forced culture, is it? No. The, the other thing that I would say, Nick, is that by one or two franchisees doing it, other franchisees get confidence. That's the other thing that I would say, the confidence of seeing other people because they've all got the opportunity. But we needed somebody out there to, to drive things forward because mm. sometimes I could have said, well, you're head office and it's easier for you because you're just head office. Um, not realising that, that we started the business in a very similar situation with one van and, and just grew it and stuff. Yeah. But, but the confidence that it gets, if, it was, well, if he can do that, then I can do it as well. Then you have the competitive element and the things grow up and it's, it's really exciting. I've got a question then. Have you got, and I don't know the answer, so I'm not setting you up to fail or pass. 
Have you got one of your franchisees who's gone through the million pound turnover barrier as part of this 10 million, 20 million journey? And when they were the first, what, how did they feel about that? Wow, that breakthrough moment. Is, is that something that's been achieved? Yeah, I think we've got three franchisees now who are um, touching on or exceeding the one million pound barrier. And, and um, one of the things that was really exciting for us once we communicated our high level goal is when we had a franchisee come to us and say, if you um, sell me more territory, because franchising works in a geographical territory that, um, uh, you know, that the, the van's operating. Uh, one of our franchisees came to us inspired by our high level goal and said, I think I can provide a million of that 20 million. And that was really exciting to, to find that as being a spin off of because we kept the goal to ourselves for years because we thought you know it was you know it was a bit audacious and um and and by by um communicating putting it out there and one of our franchisees said i wanted to you know i believe i can do a million and he did a million he, he, he surpassed that several years ago and he inspired other uh, people to do the same he also um at the other end of the spectrum we've still got some one van operations who initially felt quite intimidated by it yeah you know that's that we've got a legacy of of um, uh, some franchise owners that we took on on the old model, and um, are, are less inspired by a big goal, but um, the, they're becoming less and less of the network because more and more of the network have been getting onto the accelerated growth planning program um, and and um, competing with each other to do better and better. I'm assuming that also helps you to attract a higher level of business acumen from someone who might want to buy into the franchise because they see it as a business not as a technician led uh, franchise opportunity is that is that fair seems seems obvious to me that would what would happen yeah, yeah i mean it is i mean our old model we would we would teach the franchise owner how to paint and they would be van one and then we would ask them to employ somebody in van two and pass on some of the skills and then employ somebody else in van three. And then eventually the model was, by the time you buy vans, you won't have time to paint. Hmm. You'll be managing and getting the sales. But what happened is some of them got very stuck in that, um, that role as a, a painter, even, even if it was a part-time painter. Now that we've changed the model and now that we've got uh, quite a number of franchise owners who don't paint cars, yeah, it's, it's made the, their businesses, the franchise businesses, more valuable. And we're starting to get different kinds of applicants that come along that don't want to pay but want to manage a business. Yeah, okay. Just so far, so good. We've talked about lots of successes, lots of, you know, there's got to be some bumps in the road, hasn't there? What what have been the biggest challenges from 2004, 600,000, let's go five, let's go 10, let's go 20, let's communicate all that. What's been the biggest challenges to deal with? I'm assuming things like, you know, the growth pains of technology and back office and staff and training and all that. What what would you say has been the biggest challenge to keep going on that growth by year by year? Interesting question. Um, Rebranding um, right at the start was a challenge. Um, uh, with anything as big as that as a project, it is uh, um, uh, a huge uh, uh, undertaking. Um, but I think probably, um, as you mentioned, the, the IT um, uh, stuff that we uh, undertook um, took far longer and was far more expensive than we were ever imagined. Um, every IT project, does, I've just alienated any, anyone who works in IT as a listener. Isn't that what every IT project in every office and every business yeah. does? Like, oh, it's more expensive and it always takes longer. That's fairly common. Uh, but, but, <laughs> But the, the, the problem is it's, it's absolutely invaluable as well. It, it really is now um, the basis for the business and the changes that we're making um, currently or have made um, over the past six months are absolutely unbelievable in terms of the um, efficiencies and the customer journey um, that we can build on. Because we've got the really, really strong IT platform now, I think the, the changes that we can make over the next... Uh, a little bit of time will be really dynamic for the business. That's excellent. I mean, in terms of you're obviously well set and you've you've got a plan, and and I think 
you coming from a, a banking background, Terry, you've got discipline, I think, haven't you, as well, that goes with that. And, you know, obviously Mark's a, a, a salesperson through and through, I guess. I'm trying to say I've got no discipline. I didn't say <laughs> Sometimes people are collectively better together. That's all I'll say, Mr. Oh, Lewis. That's all I'll say. Um, so what I would say about your business model being franchise-based and you've got business owners of your brand out in the field, is there anything that you think that you've done that you would say is transferable to a non-franchise environment? You know, what are the what are the lessons that you've learned? You think, well, that would work anywhere. What give us some ideas of the things that you think have, have been a, a bit of a bedrock for you? I think what one of the um, honestly, I think I could say with all the screens, but uh, one of the big things late, lately is having the data available in your business. So one of the things that the investment in our IT program has done is it's given us access uh, to the data in, in our business that helps us then make decisions to drive it forward. Um, so for example, when we first started our national account program, and I think it was in about 2008, so we, um, we got national accounts to give us repairs and we would then subcontract them out to our franchisee. So we kept all of that information on an Excel spreadsheet. And it was really hard to be able to extract um, if there were any trends in the types of cars we were repairing or pricing information. So I think having um, a platform that gives you the right data for your business is important. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to know what you want out of it before you see you, you, you almost engineer it backwards, don't you? It's, it's, you want to know what you want to know yeah. and then create the platform to give you what you want to know. Trying to do it the other way around is quite hard, isn't it? You know, working with the platform to, to what can it do for me? It's not the way of dealing with it, is it? But sometimes Nick, you don't always know what you want to know. <laughs> that oh. and, 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 but you're right. I mean, you really need to try and understand what the key metrics are to then set up your, IT platform to capture that information. Um, and we've got a quite a complicated business in that we, you know, we've got, we, we deliver our um, service to our customers via some in-house um, technicians that are employed by Revive UK, um, uh, but the rest is by the franchise network with a number of different customer types. I'm just going to ask you about that because your customer type demographic is very wide and very, do you want to just explain to the listeners and viewers what a customer type would be for a revive potential i mean not a typical one because there's no such thing but you know what are the demographics of those customers sorry to cut across you there terry but it's quite an interesting thing for people to understand there's there's different segments in our business so uh, from uh, the general public our, our retail segment um to car dealerships which is a big part of what, the work that we do to fleet companies rental companies and insurance companies there's um smart repair insurance now that you can um buy when you buy a, a car and we act on behalf of a number of companies because of our national size to, to do that work so it's quite a diverse um uh segmentation but um that's really quite useful when um things as serious as a, a pandemic uh, hits because a lot of the car dealerships were closed for a long period of time mm. and um, they're bringing their people back was a slow process and so we needed other parts of the market to um, keep us um, as busy as we needed to be. I mean looking at what you said earlier about you've had a record sort of uh, last couple of months and, and you're going to be a record end of the quarter. Um, what was your reaction as a business on the 24th of March, because in the UK, we all stopped, didn't we? We literally all went, we don't know what we don't know. It's all a bit, it's all got a bit serious, all very suddenly. What was your reaction as business owners to that? You know, you had so many options to do whatever you thought was right. How did it affect you in the first instance? Well, we, we closed our doors. Um, we, we had to take the security and safety of our people seriously. So. Um, we um, basically um, communicated with our, our network and um, spoke to the, the franchise owners and said, we need to close to keep everybody safe. Yeah. Um, we, Terry and I um, then um, had to look at how we could divide work that we needed to do. And there was a number of things that we saw as headlines that were um, 
extremely important at this time because everything um, we went suddenly from um, March being one of the busiest months of the year to a completely uncertain and potentially very scary time. Mm. And so there were a number of things that we needed to do. So from um, a sales marketing point of view, um, my role um, during this, the, certainly during the initial time was to communicate regularly, um, extremely regularly with the network and with uh, the head office staff to let them know um, that what was going on mm. um, and to start planning with franchisees what um, we needed to do um, so that we, we we didn't disappear. You know, because there were some thoughts that some of the guys thinking, well, let's just put up here and watch Netflix for three months and stuff. Um, uh, I did and, I did that for three days. I didn't do three months. I didn't watch Netflix for three yeah. days. It's a fairly common thing I've mentioned a couple of times on the podcast. First three days, Netflix. After three days, my head was spinning, thinking, right, let's well, get back to work. Do, do you know, Nick, it, it, it probably took me a few days to, to understand what we needed to do because it was just so new. It's like, okay, what do we do? You know, how, how do we... But actually, then it clicked and stuff. And uh, I thought, yeah, no, we need to use this time effectively mm. so we come out the, the, of this in, in good position and understand what we were doing. So we, we created a strategy with the franchisees. They bought into this. We changed our, uh, how we were going to look at our market segmentation because we realized that the trade maybe quite quickly came back. And we planned what we were going to do. And because of that, we came back with a very, very successful um, uh, relaunch from a, from a finance and operations point of view. Yeah, I, I just got stuck in to make sure we collected our money in where we could and, and paid that out to our franchisees. Because what we didn't want to do is come back after a pandemic and find that all of our franchisees had, uh, had gone bust and, and we suddenly don't have a way of, you know, of, of um, repairing cars for the customers yeah. that we've got. So I concentrated on money and helping understand the, the different uh, government uh, grants and, and support scheme that was available. So okay. it was interesting. Excellent. Well, it's good to see you back. And I know back with a, ben, a, a vengeance. Um, this is titled How Managing Your Goals Created Award-Winning Success and Growth. So I'm going to finish a little bit on, on two things. The first question is touching on awards. Um, Quite rightly, you were a multi-award winning business and, 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 and held up in the franchise sector, you know, as, as someone of you know, significance and success. And as I say, the Silver Award on uh, this week is just one other example of that. So how do you view the whole awards piece in terms of importance to your business and your profile? And would you encourage other businesses, whether in the franchise sector or not, to check out their, their industry awards? I think um, uh, we we don't run the business to um, win awards and stuff. We, we, we're running the business to be as efficient and as effective as, as we possibly can. Um, entering awards and, and being a finalist in awards is, um, in my opinion, good for the business as it raises our profile. Um, and to win something like the Silver Award um, this week at the Franchise of the Year Awards, is a massive boost for everybody involved with, with Revive. Mm. And, and really, in, in my opinion, it, it is fantastic recognition for every single person involved with Revive and the hard work that they've put in during this time. Um, so, yeah, I feel very proud um, that, that, that we've done that. I think from a um, raising profile, it's, it's never uh, a bad thing, um, but it's not just about uh, awards and stuff. It's, it's, the end, it's, it's the end game. Sorry, Terry. It's, it's the end game, isn't it, for the work you've done? It's recognition for that. Sorry, you, you extend, Terry. I think it's really important to celebrate success and to uh, especially cascade down to our team when we're successful to get them um, involved in that success. So, yeah, it, it isn't the be all and end all, but it's really nice to have. You'll have, you'll have missed putting on a posh frock and having some canopies. Though. I bet your awards were virtual on Monday, weren't they? Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah mark of the posh rock so the last question and it's 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 sort of generic the one piece of advice bit you know whether you're in a franchise uh, sort of business or or otherwise if you're a business with ambition and you're looking to grow steady or otherwise ambitious or otherwise piece of advice for the listeners what would you say they need to be thinking about if they're going to achieve whatever that ambition might be steady accelerated ambitious audacious whatever it's difficult for 
us to advise on on um, steady growth because I think your 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 plans your goals should be ambitious if I'm honest and um, and that's something we've always passed on to our franchisees you know if you, you're going to have a goal if you once you start um, resting on your laurels then eventually your business will go into decline that will that will happen so I think be ambitious but but equally um, don't be frightened to share it with your team because uh, by sharing that goal. Um, you get everybody excited and you need to be able to explain what's in it for them as well. Absolutely excellent. Listen, that's been inspiring as I thought it would be. I had no illusions that it would be anything other than that, uh, having worked with you uh, a little bit on and off. As those who are listeners and, and, and viewers know, this podcast is going to be available on all the usual platforms. It's going to be available on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean and CastBox, to name a few. Um, but the contact details are there for, I've just put Terry's on there. I apologise, Mark, it looked a bit messy with two on. But uh, um, So we've got Terry's contact details there if you're looking to uh, be inspired and perhaps you might want to think about being a, uh, a business operator within the Revive family. Um, but ultimately, that's been inspiring. Goal setting, award winning, communicating, shared lessons, ambitious growth. What's not to like about that podcast there? So really, thank you, both of you. Thank you very, very much for your um, uh, contributions. Great to see you both. I like the picture of, of your team behind. It looks like you've got a third a third wheel sat behind yeah. you listening to who's not contributed, but great, great pull-up banner. So thank you, uh, uh, Terry, and thank you, Mark, and I'll see you very soon. Thanks, Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.